Romans, the 15th chapter, and I want to read a verse here that uh, is very good. Romans, the 15th chapter. Romans comes after um, Acts, that's right, thank you. Romans 15 and verse 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning. In other words, Paul is writing here and he says the things that have been written in the foretime, that is before, in the Old Testament, that's what he's referring to, were written for our learning. So the purpose of the Bible in recording the stories is for our learning. That's why the study of the Bible is so important for us because the stories that have been recorded have been selected by inspiration because they have a message not only for the time that it happened but for God's people down through the years. Get the idea? Because as I think we've mentioned this before that the Bible doesn't record everything, does it? Does the Bible record everything that happened to God's people? Does it? No, of course not. And he records a little of what's happened. Even the life of Jesus, his three and a half years, all the incidents that happened in the three and a half years are not recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, are they? Only some things. Because inspiration has selected those things that have a message for God's people down through the years. And uh, that's why the continual study of the Bible is so important for us because it's not just a, mat a matter of saying, oh, well, that's the story of the Good Samaritan or that's the good story of, uh, of um, Dave, King David or, or, or Solomon or whatever the story that we're reading about. I know that story. I've read it before. There's more to it than that. That's, we, when we understand there is always a deep message in every story and the more mature we are in the Christian life, we will see things, and I'm sure you've done this, read the stories again, suddenly, I never saw that before. You know, I, that, that never occurred to me before because God will teach us and, uh, and, and help us as we continue to study his word. And Paul is saying here that whatever was written before were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. In other words, the things that have been recorded are recorded to give us hope. And we all need hope, isn't that right? You know, when you look at your own life, there's not too much that gives you hope. Martin Luther once said that the biggest pope that he had to fight wasn't the pope that sat in Rome, it was the pope that sat in his heart. The person who wanted the kingly uh, control of his own life was inside here, wasn't over there in the Vatican, even though that's, that's pretty bad, but it's even worse inside here. You know, if I was to take a picture this morning, digital camera, and I gave it to the guys up, top and I said put it up on the screen and we all have a look at this picture of the, of the church this morning let me ask you a question whose picture would you look for first you'd be honest yes we're looking for ourselves isn't that right and the facts are that if you took a good picture if you're sitting there nice smiling and you look good what a good picture that is but if you didn't look so good, even though everybody else looked good, what a dreadful picture that is. See? That's really how much self is dead in each of us. If you're near home and you hear the, the fire engine, whose house do you think of? Yes. That's how much self is dead in each of our hearts. And that's what causes us so much um, discouragement. When we often look within our own hearts, we... We don't always match up with what we profess. What we look like on Sabbath morning is not always what we look like during the week. And I'm not only talking physically, I'm talking spiritually. 
Sometimes there's a discrepancy. And it's that, often that discrepancy that gets at us when we really uh, think carefully about things and the word hypocrite comes to mind and lots of other words and we get discouraged. And uh, the Bible says these things have been written so that we might have hope and there's not too much hope in the world today. Just go through a hospital sometime. Just lift up the, uh, listen to the news tonight. There'll be a lot of tragedies that'll go on today and, and, and over the weekend that'll leave a lot of homes um, in a very discouraged way. Accidents and so forth. I often think about these terrible road accidents that happen and, uh, and the people that are impacted by it. Isn't that right? You know, there's not just the immediate... There's a whole group of people that are impacted when someone is injured or killed. And... Um, it's not a very hopeful world. But the Bible says these things, the Bible has been written to give us hope. The purpose of the Bible is to express to us hope because we live in a very hopeless world and everything is against us. The devil has screwed everything up. And this morning I want to discuss with you what I think is the most hopeless case in all the Bible. I think it's the most hopeless. And if there's hope for a creature like we're going to study about, there's hope for us all. So would you come back to the Old Testament, to the book of Kings, 2 Kings chapter 21. Right in the first third of the Bible is Kings, so you need to go right back toward the beginning. About a third of the way into the Bible is Kings, before Chronicles, and we want 2 Kings chapter 21 and verse 9. 2 Kings chapter 21 verse 9. And uh, let's read this. It says, But they paid no attention, and Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. Now, honestly, friend, I don't know how that's possible. How could Manasseh seduce God's people to do worse, it says, than the nations whom God had already destroyed? I don't know how that's possible. But the Bible says he did, so it must be true. But from a human point of view, I don't know how it's possible to do worse than the Amorites and the Moabites. I mean, that was so bad. In their, in their lifestyle and what they did, that God had to destroy them. You may remember the Amorites inhabited a city called Jericho. And remember the children of Israel marched how many times round? Seven times. On the seventh day they went round seven times and the kids sing the, the, the song and the walls came tumbling down. And God gave specific instruction to his people about Jericho. And this is what he said. Don't touch anything inside the city. Remember that? Now one man disobeyed. What was his name? Achan. Yes, you know the story of Achan. And uh, he brought a curse upon the whole camp of Israel because of what he did. You know, I meet people, and I wouldn't be surprised that in the question box, this question comes in. It'd be interesting to see whether it does. And this is the question people often ask. They say, if God is a God of love, why did he destroy the children and the women, particularly of the Old Testament? And some people think that the God of the Old Testament and the Jesus of the New Testament are two separate people. Because God seems to be so warlike in the Old Testament, Jesus seems to be so gentle. And they can't reconcile those two things. And it's stories like uh, we're going to read here that, uh, that give fuel to that. Why did God allow that? It reminds me of the chief of police of London, who as a young Christian could not work and reconcile that problem out. He said, until I became chief of police in London, then he said, my biggest problem was why God didn't destroy London. In other words, when you know what's going on and the corruption that's going on, then you wonder, 
at God's grace at uh, allowing things to go on as, as he does. It reminds me also of Billy Graham's wife um, when she was alive. This is many years ago, and uh, I was at Avondale. A book was put out by Billy Graham called World Aflame, which dealt with the signs of Christ's return. It was a, it's a good book. I've still got it. And uh, when that manuscript was being written by Billy Graham, he asked his wife to read it before it was published. And after she read it, she said this to Billy, she said, if Jesus doesn't come back soon, he'll have to apologize for destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. Some truth in that, isn't there? When we consider that Sydney is the homosexual capital of the Southern Hemisphere, and we all know about the Mardi Gras and so forth, and uh, that's only, only one thing of what's going on day by day, and God sees it all. We see a little, and uh, what we see often disgusts us. But imagine if you were God and you saw it all. And uh, so it's a bit like a case of oranges. You all know if you have a case of oranges, and one of those oranges goes a bit... Um, white, you know, furry, what have you got to do if you want to save the rest of the oranges? Get it out, isn't that right? Because almost overnight, the whole of the box will go bad, if there's one bad. And if God hadn't removed some of these people who had become so debased and so degraded, if he hadn't removed them, then the rest of humanity would have been so affected that we wouldn't have survived. And so in mercy, God destroyed them because they were so corrupt. And yet, we're told here that Manasseh seduced God's people to do worse than these other nations. As I said, I don't know how that's possible. But it must be, because the Bible says he did. So he was a pretty bad man. A very, very bad man. In fact... Have a look at verse 11. It goes on to tell us, emphasize this point. Verse 11, because Manasseh, king of Judah, has done these abominations, he has acted more wickedly than all the Amorites who were before him and has also made Judah sin with his idols. It emphasizes it. Now, who was Manasseh's father? Hezekiah. And as if you were here a few weeks ago when we talked about Hezekiah, you'll remember that if ever there was a good man that lived, it was Hezekiah. Is that right? The Bible says he was the best man that uh, Israel ever had. That's what God says about him, so it's got to be true. Wonderful man. But he had this son born who was the worst that ever lived. And once again, you wonder how that uh, is possible, and uh, Manasseh should never have been born. Is that right? Remember the story? God extended uh, Hezekiah's life by 15 years. Remember when God said, get your house in order because you're going to die, and Hezekiah didn't want to die, so he prayed, and the Lord then extended his life 15 years. And it was in those added 15 years that Manasseh was born. He should never have been born. And if, if Hezekiah had died when God wanted him to die, then Manasseh would never have been born. And the world would have been a better place, let me tell you. There are some people that are born into this world that should never have been born. The Amorites and the Moabites should never, ever have been born. Do you know why? Where do they come from? Does anyone know where the Amorites and the Moabites come from? And if you know anything of the history of Israel, you know the Moabites and the Amorites plagued Israel all through their wilderness wanderings. Isn't that right? Where do they come from? Lot. When Lot got drunk, he had incestuous relationship with his two daughters. And as a result, this is where the Amorites and the Moabites come from. 
They should never have been born. And if Lot hadn't got drunk, that would never have happened. You see, the Bible gives us, gives us both the good and the bad and, um, because the Bible is recording humanity as it is. There's nothing sanitized in the Bible. The Bible records history as it happened. And this is not a very nice thing to talk about, but nevertheless it happened. And we see the consequences of that uh, it played out in the history of Israel to a terrible extent. And Manasseh is another illustration of someone who should never have been born. And if his father had done what God wanted him to do, he wouldn't have. And if you think I'm exaggerating when I say that Manasseh was a bad man, have a look at chapter 21 of 2 Kings, and we'll just read a little bit about him. Chapter 21, verse 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, which proves that he was born in those added 15 years. And he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. It's a long time, isn't it? You think of your life, some of you can think back 55 years, some of you can't. But 55 years, it's a fair length of time, isn't it? His mother's name was Hepzibah. All right, verse 2. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abomination of the nations, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. He raised up altars for Baal and made a wooden image. What's Baal worship? What do we call that today? That's sun worship. As Ahab king of Israel had done, and he worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. What do we call that today when people worship the, the host of heaven, the stars and so forth? What's that called? Astrology, yes. So it's not new, this astrology business that you, that's in every newspaper and uh, on television and so forth. There's nothing new about it. That's, that's as old as old can be. It's just a part of the devil's uh, teaching that's always been around and he resurrects it all the time. Verse 4. He also built altars in the house of the Lord if which the Lord had said, in Jerusalem I will put my name. In other words, he wasn't satisfied just to build these uh, Baal groves and, and worship houses outside in the, in, the, in the fields. He actually brought it into the very temple, into the holy place. Uh, verse 5, he built altars for all the host of heaven of the two courts of the house of the Lord. Verse 6, also he made his son pass through the fire, practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft, consulted spirits and mediums. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He was deeply into spiritualism. He even set a carved image of Asherah that he had made in the house of which the Lord had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever and so forth as it reads on. And God uh, warned them but they paid no attention in verse 9 and so forth. And the trouble was there's no excuse for Manasseh because he was brought up in the truth. His father and mother were wonderfully good people which encourages us to some extent as parents. You see, there's no guarantee, no matter how good the home, there's no guarantee that your children are going to turn out good. Because there's too many illustrations in the Bible of individuals who are good people. But their children have the power of choice and they have to make their own decisions. And sometimes they make those decisions in the wrong direction and, and it's no good us as parents beating ourselves up because of their choices we pray for them but I don't believe that um, that shows that we've been a bad parent I don't believe that now sometimes people are bad parents I'm not saying that there aren't bad parents but that's a, a, a child can go wrong even though the parent is a good parent and Hezekiah made some mistakes it is true but he was a very, very good man. And God says he was a good man. So um, here this terrible wretch started to uh, work, do his evil part. 
In fact, in verse 9, uh, this is chapter 21, verse 9, but they paid no attention and Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. During Manasseh's reign, he killed Isaiah the prophet. Because, and the reason we know this is because in the early part of Manasseh's reign, we find Isaiah warning him and then suddenly Isaiah goes quiet. And tradition tells us that Manasseh put Isaiah into a hollow log and then cut him in half. Now, I can't show you a text which says that, but I can refer you to Hebrews 11 where it says that some of the prophets were what? Sawn asunder. And Isaiah was one of them, I believe. And it was Manasseh that killed him. In fact, if you have a look at verse 16 of chapter 21, it tells us that Manasseh was a murderer. Chapter 21, verse 16. Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other, beside his sin by which he made Judah sin in doing evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Bible says he was a murderer. Then it says in verse 17 something which is astounding. Have a look at verse 17. Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and all that he did and the sin that he committed, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? I thought, oh, surely this guy can't do any more. But King says, go over to Chronicles and Chronicles will tell you more. Let's go over to Chronicles, which is the next book. This time, 2 Chronicles, chapter 33. The second book of Chronicles chapter 33 and verse 9 2nd chronicles 33 verse 9 33 verse 9 so manasseh seduced judah and the inhabitants of jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the lord had destroyed before the children of israel so it now says the same thing that king says and as i said how he did that i don't know but he, the Bible says he did it. Verse 10. And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people. Now, I, when I read that first, I thought, no. Because if I'd been the Lord, and maybe if you'd been the Lord, and Manasseh had done all that he'd done, I don't think that I would have just stopped at talking to him. Do you think? I think there's some more positive action that we may have taken against Manasseh at this stage. Do you think we might have been tempted to do that? I think so. But the Bible says here that the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they would not listen. Therefore, verse 11, Therefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze fetters, and carried him off to Babylon. You know, back in those days, they never needed to worry about prisoners escaping because, you know what, they hooked them together like we did with a bull through their nose so that every prisoner was hooked to the next prisoner with a chain through his nose so you can understand that when they were going back to Babylon there was no slack in the uh, in the chain they kept that chain loose making sure because you can imagine what what would happen if the prisoner in front ran off or you held back rip your nose off so the, uh, the Babylonians didn't have any trouble getting them over to Babylon once they hooked their nose. And that's how they carried them off to Babylon. And Manasseh had a hook placed through his nose. Verse 12. Now when he was in affliction. You see, when they went over to Babylon, there wasn't a nice uh, prison like the, I noticed out here at uh, Emu Plains with the cows around and uh, a bit of barbed wire, but they'll be living in Pleasant. They'll have a TV in their room. And, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like a motel. Believe me, back in those days, there was nothing like that at all. There were no windows. They were underneath the earth, a bit like Daniel. You know the story of Daniel? When he was thrown into the lion's den, he was down there. There were no toilet facilities. Just imagine this. No running water, no toilet facilities, and they're down in this prison. Terrible picture. You can just begin to imagine 
what it spank like and what it felt like. And Manasseh and his cohorts were down in prison. And it says here in verse 12, Now when he was in affliction, he implored the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed to him. Now you imagine the audacity of this guy. After all that he's done in defiance of God, bringing all this tragedy upon Israel, murdering God's people, killing the prophet Isaiah, bringing sun worship into the temple, doing all of this. And then he gets over into prison and now he begins to pray to God. Imagine the audacity of someone to do that. Would God listen to the prayer of a man like that? Well, let's just read on. And prayed to him, and he received his entreaty, heard his supplication, and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. You know, I gasp every time I read that verse. And you and I ought to be very grateful for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, who in spite of all that Manasseh did, and he's really only praying, not because he loves God. Why is he praying? To save his skin. I don't want to be down in that prison. Terrible. I'm the king. And he really doesn't pray for any wholesome reason except to save his skin. And yet God, knowing all of that, knowing his impure motives knowing all about him as only God does, still listens to his prayer, not only listens to his prayer, but gets him back into Jerusalem as the king. I gasp to think that God would answer a prayer of a man like that is just incredible to my mind. And it says here, he prayed to him and he brought him back. You know, I have watched people over the years, and I guess you have too, and I've seen people get into uh, sin. You know, when we're young, and I'd just like to address our young people in this congregation, and I was in their Sabbath school lesson this morning. There's a wonderful group of young people in this church, let me tell you. Most of the young people in this church are supporting the mission pretty regularly. It's wonderful. Wonderful. But one of the temptations that we all experience as young people, and some of us can still remember when we were young people, one of the temptations that we all have is that we must experiment, and we must try, and we won't take advice, we've got to try it out for ourselves. And sin always seems attractive before it's committed, and during it's committed, after it bites like an adder. And that's when we have a life of regrets and so forth and so on. And it's so important. That's why it's so important for us to mix in the church facilities because you go outside the church and you find friendship outside the church and believe me, that is the beginning of the road, slippery road down. Because soon you begin to compromise your thinking. You've got to. Otherwise, they call you a square. and So, all young people, pretty well, unless you're very exceptional, there's very few people who can endure peer pressure. And um, we need to be very, very careful. We want to protect our young people because make the right choices and your life will be so much different make the wrong church choices and when we choose the person that we marry is the wrong person let me tell you and there are folk in this church as there are in any congregation you make the wrong choice in that and it has repercussions for the rest of your life and you can't get away the lord can forgive you but you're saddled with the consequences of that isn't that right yes God forgave David for his sin, but the consequences 
dogged him for the rest of his life. And uh, when we try to protect our young people, it's not because we're trying to to uh, deny them some pleasure. No, because some of us know we've been trodden over those, those ways. We know where this ends. And we know enough about human nature. And uh, the, the devil here has, has uh, things all for us as young people. When we're least experienced, that's when we've got to make our biggest decisions. Isn't that right? When we're least experienced, we make our decision regarding what we're going to do and who we're going to marry. And unfortunately, sometimes when we're least experienced, that's when we won't listen. And uh, all of us are like that. That's human nature. The reason we can talk like this is because all of us are like this. It's not just some people are like that. All of us are like that. We're pig-headed. And tell me who I'm going to marry. No, he's all right, or she's all right. Not necessarily so. And sometimes those who have got a little experience can see some things that when we're inexperienced, we can't see. That's why we should listen to people with, with, that we have confidence in with a bit of experience. And my, my encouragement to young people this morning is never, ever marry someone until you talk to someone that you respect about that person. Because sometimes others can see things that you and I can't see when we're involved in love. Because love, we often say, is what? Blind. And when we are going, we need to not believe that love is blind. We've got to be open-minded when we are going together. When we're married, we become blind. That's when we must be blind. But when we're going together, we must be wide open. Isn't that right? Yes. Very true. And here we find this, um, this uh, terrible man. And I read this verse and it, it, um, the, the statement that we've just r- sung in our hymn, Amazing Grace, always comes to my mind when I read the story, that if God can save a man like that, he can save us all. Isn't that right? Because I want to tell you this this morning. There is not one person in this congregation who has sinned a tithe of what Manasseh did. Is that right? Nobody. Nobody has gone anywhere near what Manasseh did. And if Manasseh's prayer can be answered, do you think there's hope for us? Absolutely. That's why this story's been written. To give us hope. To show that God is not in the business of of rewarding according to our deeds because if God rewarded us according to our deeds none of us would have a chance is that right God is you see God's way of dealing with it is so different to ours that's why it's very difficult for us to understand God's love because we have the idea that I love someone when they love me and if they do the wrong thing I'm not going to love them you know some parents are foolish enough to say to their kids when they do the wrong thing that love is equated to actions. God loves us unconditionally. And he loved Manasseh unconditionally. And that's a great encouragement to my mind this morning. It gives me hope because all of us are discouraged from time to time as we look at, upon our lives. And we all think and do and act things that are wrong. But this story is recorded to give us hope. As Paul said in Hebrews, God can save to the uttermost them that come unto God, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for us. And it's wonderful to think that in heaven today, we have a saviour, someone who is on our side. And all we need to do is turn to him no matter what we have done, no matter what we've been involved with. God will still hear our prayers if we'll turn to him. That's, that's the, uh, the message that I get from this story. You know, in the book of Genesis, just come back to Genesis, if you wouldn't mind. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 13. You know the story of, of Cain. Cain is going to be a lost man. Why? Why is Cain not going to be saved? 
because we know he's not going to be saved. Why? Is it because he murdered his brother Abel? Well, if murder was the unpardonable sin, then of course David won't be saved, Moses won't be saved. So obviously murder is not the unpardonable sin. Let's have a look at chapter 4 of Genesis verse 13. And there may be someone here who's got the old version, you know, the old King James Version. That'll be very helpful to us here. It says, verse 13, And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. If you've got the old version, Lynn, is that the old version there? No. Who's got the old King James? Anyone with a margin down the middle? Have you got the margin down the middle? Because opposite the word punishment, there should be a little number that refers you to, the, to the, um, the margin down the middle. What does it say? Yeah, yes, that's... What? Yes, what, what, what does the margin say? It doesn't give you the, the sentence. Sister, have you got that uh, King James? What does it say? First 13. 4.13 I oh, don't have, okay, no, well it's the same in the King James as here no one has the old King James alright, well let me t quote to you what the old King James says and the margins by the way are just as inspired as the text it's just giving you an alternative reading and I think the margin is the correct translation not what's recorded in the verse because what's recorded in the verse doesn't really make sense. But what's recorded in the margin does. And this is what the margin says in the old King James. Mine iniquity is greater than it may be forgiven. What was Cain's problem? When he says mine iniquity is greater than it may be forgiven. Now, the, our version says, my punishment is greater than I can bear. See, that really doesn't give you the, the full insight. But the old version says, mine iniquity is greater than it may be forgiven. What was Cain's problem? He didn't repent, that's true, but why didn't he repent? Yes, he believed that what he had done was so bad that God couldn't forgive him. Get the idea? That's the reason why Cain is a lost person. Not because of what he did, but because he never asked God to forgive him because he was convinced that God wouldn't forgive him because of what he'd done. Get the idea? And I'm going to suggest this morning that if any person is lost in this church, and God forbid it, but if anyone is lost... It won't be because of what you've done. It'll be because you haven't believed that God would be able to forgive you for what you have done. Get the idea? Now, in the New Testament, there's the story of two men, Peter and Judas. You know the story well. We don't have to turn it up. Which of those two men sinned the greater, Peter or Judas? Which of those two men? People say to me, well, Judas did. Well... I'm not sure, because it is true that Judas betrayed Jesus. There's no doubt about that. But didn't Peter do the same thing? And Jesus warned him about it. And not only did he warn him about it, but the cock crowed once, and then he denied him. Twice at a time later, he denied him again. Then a time later, he did it the third time. So which of those two men sinned the greater? Hmm? I don't think that you can really draw a, a conclusion and say one's worse than the other. I think they're both as bad as one another. But what's the difference between Peter and Judas? When, when Peter was convinced that he was, had done the wrong thing, when he was really truly converted, what does the Bible say he went and did? He went out into the Garden of Gethsemane where he was asleep the night before and he confessed his sins to God. And he was a changed man. That's what made Peter into the apostle that we now know him to be. It was the change that took place then. On the other hand, when Judas was convinced and convicted that he'd done the wrong thing, what does the Bible say he did? He went out and hung himself. Because he never asked God to forgive him. That's the difference. 
And you see, the story of Manasseh has been recorded to give us hope. And the story of Manasseh is really the prodigal son of the Old Testament. We're all familiar with the prodigal son of the New Testament. This was the story that encouraged Israel, the Jews, down through the Old Testament. And they would be continually reminded that if God can save Manasseh, he can save us. And my message to you this morning is that if God can save Manasseh, he can save you. And he can save me. And this story has been written to give us hope. As Paul said, these things have been written so that we might have hope. And I trust this morning that God will give us fresh hope and fresh courage this week to live as God wants us to live, to ask God to forgive us, and He will freely forgive us because He's not like our natures. He is, he is forgiving. That is His nature. He cannot help but be forgiving. You and I don't enjoy that because we forgive people sometimes, you know, after we see some change and... You know, we'll put them on ice for a little while, try to get, give them 12 months and see how they get along. You know, God's not like that. God is very, very different. And I trust this morning that God will help us to believe this because understanding it and reading it this morning is one thing, to actually put it into our mind and believe it and, and, and to have that as a practice is another thing. And we need to ask God to... to put it into our minds and to cement it there so that we'll never ever be discouraged that God loves us and it's the amazing thing is that the closer we get to Jesus and his forgiveness the more he wants to change our lives get the idea so that change comes as we dwell with Jesus let's just bow our heads in prayer Lord I thank you this morning for your wonderful grace I thank you for that grace that we cannot even begin to understand but you have promised you have recorded the story to show that no man, no woman has ever done anything so bad that you won't forgive. And thank you, Lord, this morning for that wonderful good news to encourage our flagging hearts and that we will live as you want us to live and hold our heads high in, in knowing Jesus. This week, I pray for Christ's sake. Amen.